Carl, good morning. Thanks very much. Uh, we are joined by Loretta Messer, the Cleveland Fed president. Loretta, thanks for joining us this morning. Thanks, Steve. Great to be with you. Yeah, let's uh, talk where uh, those guys uh, kind of left off, which is this idea of uh, the next steps for Fed policy. And I, I guess the test that you guys have put off is this test of substantial further progress on both sides of the mandate, inflation and employment. So tell me, are we there yet? Yeah, well, Steve, thanks for pointing to the forward guidance we get, gave, because that's the way I look at policy and where we are. So I'm comfortable that we are basically there. I think on inflation, you can make a very good argument that we have made substantial further progress. In fact, we're well over 2% at this point. Some of that um, won't last, but, but some of it might. And we've also made a lot of very good progress on the employment side. Um, we still see the number of jobs lower than it was in February of 2020 before the crisis uh, hit. But we've certainly made substantial further progress since December um, when we put that forward guidance out. So I'm comfortable that we're basically there. And now it's a question of communicating what the policy stance is regarding our asset purchases and making sure that we do it in a way that is well um, you know, forecasted and well, well telegraphed so that the MAL has been doing and the whole committee has been doing is making sure that we communicate our policy stance, where we see policy going, um, and our outlook. So you're on national television with a free reign to communicate where that policy is going. Um, tell me about your thoughts about when this uh, taper process ought to begin and how long it ought to go? All right. So thanks, Steve. So, you know, my I'm comfortable if we begin to talk about, you know, what our plans are in September, and then we start tapering sometime this year. I'd like to see those asset purchases taper down so that they're completed by the middle of next year. I think there's no urgency that we do it. I think we're in a good spot. Um, with regards to where the economy is. We, we can talk about Delta as being a risk to the outlook. But right now, I think the asset purchases, we just don't need the same kind of accommodation that we needed at the height of the crisis. And I'm comfortable that we've met our uh, conditions for the, the, as we articulated the forward guidance. So tapering to start sometime this year, um, tapering to you know asset purchases to end middle of next year. Would you mind talking about the evolution of your thinking about inflation? When we spoke in June, you weren't all that concerned. You you, you seem to suggest that you weren't sure if, if, if this was permanent. It looked more transitory to you then. Uh, a couple months later, has your view on that changed? Well, I think that permanent transitory probably isn't a, a good way to explain my views on inflation. What I'm looking at is whether some of those... Uh, COVID-related increases in prices, and we've seen that in a number of places, some of the supply constraints, whether they're going to linger enough and stay on long enough that they actually get embedded into inflation expectations and then become an inflation, higher inflation under, on the underlying trend inflation, those, those core inflation measures, that, if you will, that we'd like to look at to sort of give a sense of where the where the inflation, underlying inflation rate is going. Right now, all of the people I talk to and businesses are saying that, you know, we thought that those supply constraints were going to ease off by now. And now it's all changed that they see those kind of supply conditions and higher prices, their input prices lingering until next year or even later in some cases. So I think those higher prices in some of those components will, will stay um, a bit longer than we originally expected. And that could feed into inflation expectations in a way that is not consistent with our 2% mandate. So that's what I'm, I'm watching, is whether that those kind of one of price increases become embedded in people's expectations about prices continuing to rise. That's where I think we'll, we'll have to really take a hard look to see if that's happening. So far, we've seen some increases in measures of underlying inflation, but we haven't seen that be sustained. So again, I'm very watchful on the inflation side and 
you know, your original question, has my view changed? Is yes, the evidence suggests that some of those higher prices could linger for longer than expected. Do, do you feel like when you say you will take a hard look, do you anticipate now that inflation may need to be addressed by raising rates sooner than you expected? Well, not yet. I mean, my baseline outlook is still that inflation will move back down as some of those, you know, supply constraints ease. Um, but I think it's up in the air now about when that timing will be. I'm concentrating now first on sort of the asset part, asset purchase part of our policy. If we complete that by the middle of next year, then we'll be able to sort of take a look at what the incoming data suggests about the strength of the, of the economy, both on the employment side and on the inflation side. And then we'll have, have time to assess when that first rate increase, increase would be appropriate. But right now, the focus in my policy is on what to do with the asset purchase program then we'll, we can consider raising interest rates at the appropriate time. And again, I'll point out that we'll, you know, I'm going to be guided by the guidance we gave in our statement that we continue to give in our statement about what those conditions for that first rise in the interest rate would be, which is you know inflation at 2% and moving above and employment at our maximum employment uh, mandate. So again, the forward guidance really is Loretta, guiding where my policy views are. 